if high-value cross-border payments happen in real time, then how can financial crime compliance keep up? This is the challenge facing compliance teams as banks strive to balance both customers' demands for speed and regulators' demands for security. Joining us now to talk us through these challenges and the possible solutions are Barbara Pateau, Global Head of Correspondent Banking at HSBC, and David Howes, the Global Financial Crime Compliance at Standard Chartered. Both of you, a huge welcome to Cybos TV. Thank you. Now, uh, Barbara, you've got an interesting background because you've worked on both sides of the yeah. fence. You're in financial crime compliance. Now you're uh, obviously head of correspondent banking. How do you see real-time payments and compliance fitting together? Well, I think they have to be compatible and we have to do both because we have an obligation to meet our customers' requirements with regard to real-time payments, and that's key. But equally, we have an obligation to meet our financial crime compliance requirements from a, a regulatory perspective. So we have to do both. And we are building the processes that we can do both, and uh, that is key, that we can manage them. And, and David, what's your view of the key threats from cyber criminals to the security of real-time payments? Well, gee, I think that um, real-time basically reduces the opportunity for us to recover the proceeds of fraud when one takes place. And that's a, a really important issue, but I don't think it's the main issue. I think the main issue is actually the growing sophistication, the growing availability of cyber criminal activity, and that, that increases the money laundering threats to a bank. It also increases the likelihood that banks themselves are targeted by cyber criminals. Barbara, how do the compliance controls work at the moment? Well, you could kind of break them down into four different areas. Um, one, list management. List management is a key function, is what lists they screen, how they manage them, how they control them. And then equally you have data. Data is key, it's what data is feeding the engines and, what, and your rules. And then systems. Um, the systems we put over it, is it a, a, an in-house solution or is it off the shelf that you buy it? But equally the rules you apply on that, it is key and it is, that, that is a real requirement. And fourth and finally, it's, it's quite important, it's the process and governance you put over that end to end, that is key. Um, and that, that's really, if you break it down, that sounds quite simple, those four simple steps, but there's a huge uh, industry behind mm. those four simple steps. Mm. Nothing in life is straightforward. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but look, yeah. I mean, as we move to real-time payments, as Barbara said, we've got four key areas. Which of these controls are going to have to change? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's the challenge, right? Because as, as Barbara's described, mm. it's, it's actually change across um, all of them. And let's start by recognising that you know, within individual institutions across the industry as a whole, it's not as if this process today is running efficiently. Yeah. I think as you move to real time, what, what's going to happen is uh, the pressure on it's only going to increase. So uh, we've certainly got to think a lot more about how we substitute uh, out of, out of labour, out of, out of people and into technology and make better use of you know, the tuning of the systems that, that, that Barbara's referenced. Uh, at the same time, I think we've got to think about how we you know, use new and emergent technology to automate more of this process. And I think the final bit, and the bit that we're probably not thinking enough about at the moment across the industry, is recognising that you know, intra an institution, there's a lot that we can do, but, mm. but inter, mm. sort of between the different parts of the payment chain, that's, I think, where the real opportunity is to, to, mm. to, to, to find efficiencies and still deliver a really high level of compliance. Mm. Mm. Barbara, David rightly mentioned the new and emerging technologies. It sure. would seem that AI might be a potential solution here. Is that currently being used? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. In, in HSBC, um, we have 1.2 million payments a day we screen. We stop about 75,000 of those payments, and we're using machine learning and AI to look at that and discount some of those alerts. And we close about 35,000 of those alerts using that new technology. That is a huge step forward for us. Wow. And it just means that we can reduce the amount of people involved in that process going forward. So we're emerging from being effective to being driving to more efficiency in this pro process. And that's key for us as we go forward. Mm. Mm. But then what comes out of that, and I'd like to put this to you, David, is the performance level. Because you know, AI would have to reach um, astonishing performance levels uh, in, a, in order to be reliable enough for compliance. Yeah, I, that's absolutely right. So at Standard Chartered, we've got two basic uh, tests that we need, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence to, to pass before we want to put it into production. The first is we need to be confident that it's at least as reliable as a human being in going through that adjudication process. So, so we know that humans will have a certain error rate and we've, you know, across the industry sort of layered in extra process to accommodate for that. 
uh, AI machine learning first needs to be at least as good as that, if, if not to surpass it. The second thing is we need a way of identifying where it's gone wrong and being able to explain why it's go wrong, gone wrong. And that's, that's kind of important for two reasons. One is we might need to then go back and look at some of the other decisions that the, that the technology took. Um, the second is to, to not institutionalize that mistake to, to learn from it and to, to improve the outputs when it's continued to be applied in, in future cases. It's very exciting. Barbara, how can you supervise AI to yeah. make sure that it's performing properly? Yeah, I think that is a real you know, emerging issue for us to make sure that we can do that. So transparency is key and challenge is key. Um, but for us, it, it is documenting the reasons we're putting in, um, information in and the rules we're setting and why we're setting those rules throughout risk appetite, risk tolerance, and documenting that clearly. So that is really, really important mm. as we go forward. But equally, I would say as an industry, and David, is, I'm sure you're aware of this, we, we have to work together and share our experience in this space. And then banks and communities like uh, here at, at Cybos working together and sharing that information, it is key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but given all these obstacles, et cetera, that have to be overcome in relation to, to AI, when do you think, David, that it's going to become a, a key part of the compliance for real-time payments? So it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Barbara and I were talking <laughs> yeah. just beforehand, and then <laughs> yeah. uh, I learned HSBC is already, uh, already deploying it, which sort of goes to, goes to show that the future's already here. It's yeah. just unevenly distributed, and and you know where we've been experimenting at Standard Chartered is more in the in the name screening space, which is more of a static process. Uh, our our intent, though, is though to, to to build on that and then start deploying it into into real time when we're comfortable that the solution we've got has the has the capability to to, to meet what we need it to do. But but yeah, the, the evidence is there that people are already adopting this. Mm -hmm. Barbara, real-time compliance is not something that correspondent banks can deliver on their own necessarily. What do you uh, need your customers to do in order for them to be part of the process? So correspondent banking is a relationship, it's a partnership that we have, and it is so important we get the transparency from our customers in this space. But equally, I, I'm learning here at Cybos, I'm learning so much from meeting our clients day to day, what they're doing, how they're moving forward with their digital agenda. So for me, it is that partnership and that transparency, so that is key for me, mm. ongoing engagement. And David, what role do you think global services like GPI and global standards like ISO 20022 are likely to play in delivering that real-time compliance? So it's actually building on the yeah. point Barbara's just been making. Um, I, think, I think greater standardisation is always going to under, underpin efficiency, but, but to my mind, some of the big opportunities that, that the GPI tools can offer is, is actually greater transparency. So if we've got uh, uh, you know, reliable quality data coming through the, 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 through the system, through the network, yeah. um, that's actually going to greatly simplify some of these processes and you know, more importantly ensure that we've got the kind of transparency we need to be comfortable with the compliance that, that we need to deliver. Yeah. Okay, we have to leave it there. It's an interesting subject and one which I'm sure will be continued throughout the Cyborg sessions. But Barbara Pato and David Howes, thank you so much for joining us on Cyborg thank TV. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.